David versus Goliath, 11th century BC. The Battle of Agincourt, 1415. The Miracle on Ice, 1980. The One Two Three Kid versus Razor Ramon, 1993. Great underdog stories all. And this one leaves them all in the dust. The Last Seduction is, or was supposed to be, a trashy little made-for-cable thriller that would fill some time on HBO's nighttime schedule. And they didn't mind waiting around in the low-rent neo-noir muck with Showtime and Cinemax. But a funny thing happened on the way to obscurity. The Last Seduction was... good, actually. So good that it wound up shaking up the conservative Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and challenging their stuffy rules about theatrical runs. Linda Fiorentino plays Bridget, a tough-as-nails New York City sales manager who makes Alec Baldwin's character in Glengarry Glen Ross look like Mother Teresa. Want me over your shoulder all day, Bernie? Huh? Ask for the sale four times every time. Got it? Her husband Clay, played by Bill Pullman going sleazy when that was out of character for him, is a doctor in residence who sells off pharmaceutical cocaine to settle some gambling debts. When he comes home to Bridget, he loses his cool and slaps her across the face. It winds up being a $700,000 slap because Bridget steals the cash while Clay is in the shower, and she hightails it only to get stuck in Beston, a small suburb of Buffalo. There she meets Mike, a good-natured lunkhead with a shady past, played by Peter Berg. I say good-natured even though Mike has some misogynistic views on the women of Beston, and even more problematic views that serve as a plot point later on. Chris, these women are anchors. Say what? They're planted here. You get too close to one, Beston's got you for life. Bridget agrees to sport sex at Mike's apartment with the attention of heading out to Chicago. Her lawyer, played by the always fantastic J.T. Walsh, advises her to settle in Beston for a while because her husband will expect her to go to Chicago. So what? Hold on to it for how long? <sighs> well, as long as it takes to uh, finalize a divorce. Since Bridget can't use any of the cash without laundering at first, she searches the one ads and finds a sales job. Of course, because small towns like this in the Northeast sprout up around one industry, everyone in town works at the same insurance company, including Mike. She tells him to forget that they ever met, but since she's stuck in this town until the divorce is final, she hooks up with him again. Mike wants more, but Bridget is cool to the idea of any emotional attachments. The problem is that Clay is waiting her out, hoping that she'll crack with too much time away from New York City and her lawyer advises her not to spend too much time alone. During some rare conversation, Mike lets it slip that one can tell if a husband is cheating on his wife just by looking at his credit report. Sounds like a real gem. Actually, he was a son of a bitch. I could tell from his credit report. Can't tell that from a credit report. Sure you can. You can tell lots of things from credit reports. Yeah, like Bridget, whose mind seems to constantly be playing four-dimensional chess, suggests they go into business together, selling murders to angry women whose husbands are cheating on them. Mike, of course, thinks that murder is immoral and wants no part of it. But Bridget has a way of being persuasive. And that's all I can say about it without getting into major spoilers. The Last Seduction is a transcendent thriller. One that goes well beyond its genre. Hard-edged, clever heroines in charge of their own sexuality are commonplace today. But back in 1994, Bridget Gregory was a revelation. It was the first mainstream English language film to say... What if we took all of those film noirs from Double Indemnity to Body Heat and told them from the woman's point of view, moral code be damned. And Bridget is what makes it work. Instead of finding myself aghast at how the horny male protagonist had just been duped, I found myself snickering right along with Bridget as she stayed five steps ahead of everyone and improvised her way out of sticky situations into an even better position. Part of this is due to Steve Baranchek's clever script which allows Bridget some fantastic moments of cunning and manipulation. Baranchik knocks the screenplay out of the park on his first try. According to IMDb, an early draft of the film was told from the point of view of Peter Berg's Mike Swale, which would have been a monumental mistake and dragged the film into the den of mediocrity that was late-night cable noir. Whether or not he meant to, Baranchik draped a Jean-Paul Sartre lesson over a film noir plot in the same way that Ryan Johnson hung America's racial and economic tensions over a murder mystery in Knives Out. Bridget has everything she wants, but she's trapped in her own personal hell, with, as her Faustian lawyer constantly reminds her, no exit. Sadly, this was lightning in a bottle for Baranchek. 
He penned only a few more films, including the Kira Knightley flop Domino. He has since retired to Arizona, where he writes children's books and teaches writing. Some of the credit for the film needs to go to director John Dahl, who sets up the film as more of a black comedy than a dramatic film noir. Dahl takes this film seriously only to the extent that he does a competent job of lensing it, but beyond that, he just wants to make a fun film. Dahl was no stranger to quirky noir when he made this film, having directed the equally twisty Kill Me Again and Red Rock West. Dahl would go on to be a house director for the Showtime Network, directing several episodes of Dexter and Ray Donovan. But of course, the bulk of the credit for this film must go to Linda Fiorentino. Like Berenchek, this was Fiorentino's peak. She had several roles in teen movies, comedies, and television prior to this, but nothing that would indicate this level of talent. Her performance is spellbinding at times, convincing you that Bridget might have sympathetic layers underneath, only to pull the rug out with a smirk and a sardonic snicker. Bitch, what made you do this? I don't know. You slapped me. The role requires Fiorentino to have a simmering intellect below the surface, and she makes it impossible not to buy into while also rallying you to cheer for Bridget. Unfortunately, Hollywood never found a good way to capitalize on Fiorentino's talent after this. A few more noir thrillers were dumped on shelves after the success of The Last Seduction, and she wound up with a starring role in the then-red-hot Joe Esterhouse's Jade, a flop that cooled her off considerably. Her biggest film, without a doubt, is the Will Smith, Tommy Lee Jones classic, Men in Black, in which she plays the token female lead. She does bring a lot of fun to the role, but it's a thankless job playing third fiddle. Even more salient than how good the film is, and it is good, is how bad it was intended to be. Steve Baranchek was interviewed by Creative Screenwriting and admitted that he saw the film as a quick cash grab, a way to tap into the burgeoning made-for-cable erotic thriller market. The producers at ITV certainly saw it that way. According to legend, one of the producers saw some dailies of the film, thought it was too artistic, and halted production until John Dahl promised that they weren't making an art film. It's unfortunate because the studio cut many of the sexual role-playing scenes for being too artsy, and the film refers to them later on to develop character motivations. Of course, ITV's tune would change when critics started taking notice of the film, and especially of Fiorentino. Roger Ebert called it one of the year's best five films. Linda Fiorentino won an Independent Spirit Award, a New York Film Critics Award, and a London Film Critics Award for Best Actress. And then came the controversy. See, by and large, made-for-cable movies aren't supposed to be good. Sure, occasionally you'll have great films like Citizen X and the various award-winning documentaries HBO produced over the years. But that's what the Ace Awards are for. Sleazy HBO films aren't supposed to compete with the likes of Forrest Gump and Pulp Fiction. At least, that is the Academy's position, and largely remains so to this day. ITV, realizing what they had, boosted the film into theaters and filed a lawsuit against the Academy, trying to get Fiorentino an Oscar nomination. It was mostly a publicity stunt, but it did get people in the industry to reevaluate how they thought about cable. Most cable thrillers from the 90s are cash-grabbing schlock, trying to capitalize by throwing a sexy name actress who's desperate for work into a few nude scenes to generate interest. This film transcends any of that. Yes, it does have sex, but the scenes are meaningful and character-driven. Fiorentino is allowed to deliver a ferocious performance, and everyone just clicks with the material. This is one you want to go out of your way to track down. Next up, I take a deeper look at The Last Seduction with a video essay, or you can check out a lesser Fiorentino flick.